In this video, we'll look at doing calculations with Markov chains. There's an endless variety of calculations we could do, and all of them come down pretty much to two basic ideas. After you've watched this video, you should try out some of the exercises. They'll all ask all sorts of different questions. For example, the probability of an epidemic dying out, or the expected rate of return in a betting game. All the questions ask for different things, but the calculations all hinge on two basic properties. Well, we'll work through an example calculation first, and then after we've gone through it, we'll pick out these two basic properties. Here's the example, my Cambridge weather simulator. Here's the state space diagram and the transition matrix. The question asks us, if it's gray today, what's the chance of rain two days from now? In other words, if x0, x1, dot, dot, dot is the Markov chain, what is the probability that x2 equals rain conditional on x0 equals gray? For the first step of the calculation, I'm going to condition on the value of x1. This is using the law of total probability. Here's the law of total probability written out in its general form. There are actually two standard ways to write it. The first form is for calculating a plain probability, the probability that a random variable big A takes value little a by conditioning on all the ways this event might happen, say, on all the values of some unknown random variable b. The second form is for calculating a conditional probability. We can condition on b just like before, and all we do is carry this baggage, the condition big C equals little c, we carry it around with us in each of the terms. And that's what I used up above. I used the law of total probability, and I carried the baggage x0 equals g around in each of the expressions. All the basic rules of probability, the law of total probability, Bayes' rule, definition of independence, they all come with a conditional version. All you do is stick conditional on c as baggage onto every single one of the probabilities, and then everything just works. They're written out in full in the printed notes. Uh, and the printed notes also discuss what to do when the thing you want to condition on has probability zero. It's just the same sort of likelihood formulae that we spent so much time on when we were studying Bayes' rule. But back to this question. Next step is to simplify the first term. This term is the probability for x2 conditional on x1 and x0. But the whole point of a Markov chain is that x2 is generated directly from x1, and once we know x1, then x0 is irrelevant. We called this memorylessness. The next step is simply rewriting the two probabilities in terms of the transition matrix P. The first term is the property of going from x to r, Pxr, and the second term is the property of going from g to x, Pgx. Finally, just a bit of algebra to tidy up. This looks like a matrix multiplication, so let me write it like that. The probability we just calculated is the p squared matrix, rho g, column r. In fact, there's a general result here. The probability of going from state i to state j in n steps is given by the relevant entry of the transit transition matrix raised to the power n. OK, so that's a typical calculation with a Markov chain. Let's step back and highlight the two key steps. The first key step is memorylessness. That's the defining feature of Markov chains, the idea that the next state is generated based only on the current state. So if we know the current state, we can throw away the past history. The next key step is something that's almost too subtle to spot here. The rule for generating the next state is the same at every time step, which is why we use the same p-matrix for the transition from x1 to x2 as for x0 to x1. I call this resetting the clock. We only used resetting the clock in a very simple way here. The next example will show a clever use of the same idea. Here's the question. It's about what's called hitting probabilities. Pause the video and read. <laughs> 
This question is asking us to find pi x, the probability that, starting from state x, the random surfer hits my website, site 0, before hitting Twitter, site 5. Let's start by turning this into a question about Markov chains. Let xn be the page the user is on after n clicks. The problem says that from each page they select an outgoing link at random. This means it's a Markov chain. Remember, the defining feature of a Markov chain is memorylessness, i.e. what you do next depends only on where you are now, not on the past. Actually, to be technical, a Markov chain is an infinite sequence and it's not allowed to just stop. So we need to add an edge from page 5 back to itself and then it's a proper Markov chain. OK, let's write out the probability that we're trying to calculate. We want pi x, the probability that, starting from x0 equals x, the Markov chain, capital X, eventually hits state 0. I'm going to use the law of total probability here to condition on x1, the same trick we used in the last example. Now, this equation holds for all states x except for 0 and 5, where I already know the answer. Pi sub 0 is 1 and pi sub 5 is 0. Next step, memorylessness. That's why I did the conditioning in the previous step. I know I can use the memoryless property if only I have x1 in the condition. It wasn't there originally, so I had to bring it in using the law of total probability. Now that we do have x1 in the condition, we can ignore x0 by memorylessness. I've also bunked in the transition matrix entry here, p sub xx1. Now, this next step is interesting. I need the probability that x hits naught, given its value at time 1. For this, I can reset the clock. If I start it in some state at time 0 and look at its future, it's exactly the same as if I started it at time step 1 and looked at its future. This means that the first term is nothing other than pi sub x1, the probability we're trying to calculate. So what we've produced here is a recurrence relation about the values of the pi vector. In fact, it looks rather like a matrix multiplication formula, so let's write it in matrix notation. We've shown that any pi x is simply the p matrix, the matrix of transition probabilities, times the pi vector. Actually, one small correction. The algebra we just did applies to all states x apart from the two we're interested in. We know that pi naught equals 1 and pi 5 equals 0. We can encode those equalities by tweaking the matrix equation, replace the top row of the matrix by all zeros and the bottom row by all zeros, and say that the left-hand side is equal to the modified matrix times pi plus a constant vector. This is just bookkeeping so that we can write out all our equations in a simple matrix form. Anyway, the point of this matrix form is that it's easier to program that way. Here's the code. First, I get the transition matrix P. I type in the adjacency matrix for the graph, and I use that to get the transition probabilities for my random walk. All this code does is it says if there are n links out of a page, then each link has probability 1 on n. I always like to do a sanity check when I'm doing computations with Markov chains. Each row of the transition matrix has to sum to 1. In other words, from every state, the sum of the probabilities of all the possible transitions you could make from that state must be equal to 1. Next, set up my matrix equation. Let's write it as pi equals q times pi plus b, where q is the p matrix, but with the top and bottom rows zeroed out. We'll just rewrite it in the form that NumPy expects for linear equations. Matrix times unknown vector equals constant vector, and NumPy solves it for us. OK, so that's how we do calculations with Markov chains. Just one little side note about hitting probabilities. 
If we're trying to calculate hitting probabilities for a Markov chain with an infinite state space, then obviously we can't just use a computer to solve the matrix equations directly. And, in fact, the equations of the sort we found here might possibly have multiple solutions. There's a remark in the printed notes about what to do in that case. OK, let's summarize the general strategy we've used. Whenever we set up a Markov chain model, there are two things we know. We know the transition probabilities because we specify them as part of our model. And we know that the chain is memoryless. That's the defining feature of Markov chains. And memorylessness is why these one-step transition probabilities are all we need to give in order to fully specify a probability model. And the general strategy for calculations leverages these two things. First, we want to wrangle the expression we're trying to compute into some form where we can use one-step transitions. Here are the two calculations we've just been through. In both cases, we use the law of total probability to condition on x1 because that lets us use our one-step transition probabilities. And the other part of the strategy is to use memorylessness, which lets us strike out the bits of the past that are irrelevant.